One of the most sensitive and delicate topics related to Jehovah's Witnesses is the blood issue. There's a need for people on both sides to be better informed, so this video is intended to assist in opening that dialogue constructively. I'll focus on covering a lot of ground relatively quickly, and citing the scriptural and scientific sources for more depth after that. So the most common concern I see across my internets is J-dubs are sacrificing their lives to blindly follow the arbitrary and irrational whims of a group of men. But breaking the wheel of blind faith is precisely the foundation of our congregation. We should be realistic and realize that there are millions of us, and a minority of people will put themselves in the hazardous situation combining poor reasoning with blind faith, the inevitable correction of which is the root cause for a lot of bad times. The more rational majority have two good reasons, the primary one being scriptural, and this is as important as it is simple, Genesis 9-4, Leviticus 17, 10-11, and Deuteronomy 12-23 prohibits the consumption of blood. For good reason, and we'll get, in that, we'll get to that in a minute. But that's Old Testament. Acts 15-20 isn't. That's, that's, that's the New Testament one. And it confirms what the Old Testament says. But anytime we're interpreting prohibitions, we should also keep in mind what Jesus said at Mark 2.27. Here talking about the Sabbath, but it extends to the rest of the law. Seriously, pause this, go read that. Anyways, this leaves us with our second priority, which more people will be interested in. The functional justification for why this call to abstain is an overall loving direction. So let's go into some history. It took 32 centuries since Leviticus was written for a successful human blood transfusion. It wasn't until 1900 when the concept of distinct blood types was discovered. In the 1960s, transfusion started being uh, more reliably good than bad, uh, with a few major advancements, including storage improvements and a better understanding of the complexity of positive and negative blood types, RH factors, and all that. Um, but by this time, doctors had taken notice of Jehovah's Witnesses abstaining from blood and started developing bloodless surgery options. By the 1970s, we started screening donated blood for diseases like hepatitis, and a cardiologist named Denton Cooley, and everybody should know that guy's name, by the way. If you don't know Denton Cooley's name, Google the guy. He did some absolutely amazing things. And it was one of the things he did was he demonstrated that even open heart surgery could be safely performed on Jehovah's Witnesses without any need for blood transfusions. In the decades since then, we've started screening for things like AIDS, Mandiab disease, all that stuff. Anyway, screening improvements are constantly evolving, but so are potentially deadly and contagious viruses and bacteria. So here's where j -Dub would be tempted to spend the majority of his time listing every possible adverse reaction to justify our stamp, but I suspect that the people watching this are going to be the ones that I consider intelligent enough to be worth debating. So they're going to be skeptical, and they're going to see me listing 10 minutes worth of plausible adverse reactions as just a scare tactic, and I don't need to do that because you're more likely to trust unbiased professional sources, so I'm going to put those in the YouTube description. The first video is going to be done by a channel called Registered Nurse RN. She's talking about how to safely transfuse people, so she's not going to be biased towards my side of the argument at least. And she's right that they're very aware of the signs to look out for. They're generally going to be able to stop the transfusion and treat most of those issues that come up. But there's not really a difference between a transfusion stop for safety and a patient that doesn't want to take blood in the first place. The only difference is they have an additional complication from the transfusion that had to be stopped. If it's just an allergic response, you're only going to have a relatively minor strain on your immune system, but the antihistamines you have to use to treat that relatively minor strain is treating that reaction by impeding the immune system that you kind of rather have at 100% at the moment. Another point I'll make about that video is about 24 minutes in she sort of glances over disseminated intervascular coagulation which is fine because she's not trying to make an exhaustive list but i did want to be fair and say that any avoidable embolism and the resulting depletion of clotting factors would be nice to be avoided but they don't automatically cascade into full-blown dic although i do suggest reading a study from last year uh, i'll mark it as reference seven in the description uh, it's a study called uh, Association of Perioperative Red Blood Cell Transfusions with Venous, with Venous Thromboembolisms in North American Registry. And it's not behind a paywall, so you can anybody can read it. It's very supportive. I won't go too far into that because I have a lot of information to go over. Now, I don't recall her going over trolley, and that stands for Transfusion-Related Acute Lung Injury. I'll refer you to a recent study. It's mark number three. 
it finds about 200 to 400 trolley deaths per year. Given that nearly 90% of transfusions are precautionary one to two unit transfers given just to be on the safe side, uh, there's still far more people dying from unnecessary transfusions than people who die from rejecting a transfusion. And then the other thing is she mentions circulatory overload, which isn't quite as serious, but I just like the fact that transfusion associated circulatory overload is abbreviated TACO. Seriously, spell it out. It's great. So depending on your situation, there's all kinds of options that you have. If you know you're going into surgery, it's going to involve a lot of bleeding. Uh, you start with preoperative erythropoietin treatment. That generates a whole bunch of blood cells, so you have more blood cells to lose. Combine that with intraoperative hemodilution, and that allows you to lose more volume without losing as many blood cells. You combine the two, and you can allow for a lot more bleeding before any actual problems arise. And then the blood loss that is unavoidable can be salvaged with a cell saver. Sucks it up, cleans it, returns it to the patient, everybody wins. On top of that, doctors should never underestimate the importance of patient positioning and temperature. It's not just for uh, comfort until the anesthesia kicks in, it, but it can make a significant difference in circulatory pressure and therefore blood loss. And I know this is a serious topic, but can we just pause for a second and appreciate the ultrasonic scalpel, how it minimizes blood loss by cutting and coagulating at the same time? I know I can't be the only one that's comforted by the idea that it gives surgeons a functional lightsaber. Anyways. Say you're there for trauma, and unexpected volume loss has already happened. Acellular volume expanders do have some limitations. You can't replace all your blood with saline and starch. But blood has limitations too. To avoid transfusion-related sepsis, blood has to be stored cold. The transfusion has to be started within 30 minutes and completed within 4 hours. And blood can only be transfused so fast without sending a patient into hypothermia. The thing is, a low enough temperature to retard bacterial growth and avoid contamination the, the red blood cells are at the same temperature, and similarly ineffective at their one job, transmitting oxygen. Also, even without notable hypothermia, blood cold enough to control bacterial growth is also cold enough to constrict your capillaries, meaning that not only is the donated blood not doing its job, but it's also restricting your blood's access to the tissues that it needs to oxygenate. Anyways, here, look for yourself. Dr. Andreas Meyer Hellman and colleagues from the Helios Clinic Erfurt, Germany, used a cytoscan to film the sublingual microcirculation pre- and post-transfusion in a patient with severe gastrointestinal bleeding. The patient's hemoglobin fell to 2.8 grams per deciliter. This video shows the microcirculation after initial resuscitation with an acellular volume expander. What red blood cells are left are circulating through all the multi-cell and single-cell capillaries. The next video shows the same microcirculation after the transfusion of three units of stored allogeneic red blood cells. Clearly, here there is reduced flow. Single cell capillaries are swollen. There is uneven distribution of the red cells, blockage and sludging, and many areas where there are no red blood cells in contact with the tissues. So I also strongly encourage people to watch the rest of that video. Uh, it is hosted on YouTube, but if you go to reference number two in the description, it'll link you to Australia's National Blood Authority website, and that's where they host the rest of their information. They have a section on patient blood management that's very informative. So, have I changed your mind? I doubt it. That wasn't my intent. My goal was never to get other people to change their standards to match my own, but I hope there's at least a little less stigma in the world. Even if your perspectives on religion and medicine haven't changed a bit, I hope to demonstrate that we aren't lemmings mindlessly following a group of men who are just arbitrarily deciding to change the definition of truth, but is actually well thought out, has scientific merit, and has rational backing. And studies consistently show that those who follow the scriptural advice tend to be better off for it, not worse. The only scientific study that I've seen cited by our more enthusiastic detractors is the Kitchen study from 1993 which I encourage people to directly read in its entirety. It's not behind a paywall, and I'll cite it below as reference number four. It compiles the results of other studies that tracked anemia-related deaths among Jehovah's Witnesses that refused blood transfusions during major surgeries. Uh, the oldest one goes back to 1977, or at least it was published in 1977, so it was um, studied over a period of time before a lot of the major advancements had been made. Um, anyways, the author of the Kitchen Study found that the overall risk for anemia was comparable to people with no limitations on transfusions, even when weighed down by these two studies with worse than normal results. The study that appears the worst noted 15 deaths out of 542 major cardiovascular surgeries, but only three listed anemia as the direct cause. 
the other 12 simply listed it as a potential contributing factor. The other study lists three deaths out of 36, but notes that this is not abnormally high given the complex procedures referred here from other sites. Even then, of the three, one had anemia as a potential contributing factor. The second described surgery as uneventful with minimal blood loss, but still ended at cardiac arrest. The third suffered a post-operative bleed, and her husband agreed to a blood transfusion, but still died from blood loss, listed as the primary reason. The author goes on to note the additional benefits of avoiding unnecessary complications associated with blood transfusions, and specifically found the benefits of the Jehovah's Witnesses' stance to outweigh the risk. The paper is overall decidedly positive, despite how some have misrepresented it. But I really wanted to make sure that I take the concerns that I've heard seriously, because, well, look at this guy. That is the face of honest concern, and based on the information he has, his outrage is both reasonable and righteous. I respect this man, and I hope the information finds him and others with similar concerns. And it's our job as Jehovah's Witnesses to make sure that his concerns are unjustified. We can't be what he thinks we are. There is good, solid evidence of the benefit of God's loving law to abstain from blood. Blood is sacred because life is sacred, and we can respect God and the lives that belong to Him, not us, by making every reasonable effort to seek out safe and effective alternatives, which in 2019 are readily available. But what has the society said on the topic of eating meat with blood in it? Are we expected to dry out our food to ensure that not a single drop of blood remains? No. We avoid eating blood intentionally, and we make reasonable efforts to drain the blood from the meat, and that's good enough. Witnesses, elders, and especially anybody contributing to the Hospital Liaison Committee should give prayerful consideration to the following passages when determining what constitutes a reasonable effort to abstain from blood. And then the scriptures I would point you to would be Matthew 12, 1 through 8, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13, and Luke 14, 1 through 6. There's also a lesson to be learned by comparing the actions of the Apostle Peter with the Apostle Didymus. Peter is referred to as the rock upon which the congregation was built, and look at his actions in John 18, verses 17 through 27, and then compare that with the attitude of Didymus, also known as Doubting Thomas, at John 11, 5 through 16. Um, but analyzing those scriptures would take quite a bit of time, and uh, I'm going to go now. Okay, bye.